I wanted to say a few words at this event tonight. Well, I kept thinking, well, what's a few words? And then I uh, told uh, Jack, I think at Pinewood the other week, I was probably gonna talk a little bit about the history of the place. We've already had some of that. So this is probably gonna be the shortest history lesson you've ever had, but I'll try to make it interesting. I'm gonna ask a real a question first. I just did this over at the table. How many people in here know why pinto beans are eaten in the South? They're grown out west. <laughs> pinto beans are eaten in the South because of all the mill towns that existed in the South, you know, 100 years ago. It was the cheapest form of protein that they could buy and bring in. Same was true in Kentucky and West Virginia with the coal mines. There was really train loads of pinto beans headed to the south every fall at harvest because of that. I know that fact because of an old gentleman in South Carolina that was, he was with Pierce Young and Angel. He was a second generation young in it. And they hauled, they, they shipped or bought and had shipped to the, the south hundreds of train loads of pinto beans over the years. Just that little bit of trivia. As far as the history, I'll start, uh, we, we know who started to cut the uh, business, what it was about. I came to work in September of 1966. I was in Sand Hills Community College, uh, my uh, second year down there in a business administration course. And uh, Brenda and I were, had got married and I decided we needed a little more money. So I came up and decided to get a job on the second shift Went to work for a guy by the name of Bill Richardson. He's known as Big Bill, and I, some of you in here, I'm sure know him and remember him. Bill weighed about 400, over 400 pounds, so hence the name Big Bill. Uh, but I realized right quick that it was a good place to work. I, even then, when it was just, you know, luck, there was an enthusiasm in people's uh, demeanor and, and their work efforts. And, uh, I got, after I wanted to go into sales, I thought, so I saw Clay Presnell on the floor one day and asked him about it. Well, he came back to me about two days later and said, uh, didn't have anything in sales, but they had a position open in Aberdeen, North Carolina, where they had a second plant. And they pre he presented it as I was gonna be in a kind of an assistant plant manager <laughs> at that time, going down to help Robert Allman run the facility. They were involved with a lot of seasonal products. Green beans in particular was something they were into. So on the first day or two of June, they, they, offered, they gave me a $75 straight salary per month. I, real, I mean, per week. I realized real quickly what that meant. There was no overtime. The first week I was there, I worked probably 75 hours, 12 to 14 hours a day. Second week, the same thing. I figured it up one week and I was working for like 60 cents an hour. And so I called the uh, figure of office here and there was a fellow by the name of Carvis Haynes, which was, I guess, the chief accountant at that time. I'm sure others here remember Carvis. And I told him what my issue was about the pay and he never missed a beat. He said, well, if you want to work there, that's what you're getting. If not, find you somewhere else to go. <laughs> Since I was one eighth of the draft, I had nowhere else to go, so I decided I'd stay where I was at. So good, really good news happened that October of those '67. The Lux brand was sold to a drug holding company at 685 Third Avenue in Manhattan, uh, American Home Products Corporation. American Home Products Corporation also had a foods division, which was Chef Boyardee. Primarily at that time, canned pasta. But at that time, Chef Boyardee was the leading marketing uh, brand of frozen pizza. That was just it had just come into being. I think in the in the ten years prior to that, they even built a new plant in Laporte, Indiana, to put a bakery there just to make pizza crust for the for the pizza. Then they lost the business to Gino's and Totino's within about ten years and. Uh, <coughs> The other thing I was going to point out, though, it was, that was a really big change for the employees of uh, Lux and for the community. First, we immediately uh, became eligible for uh, paid vacation, paid holidays, and the biggest one of all was health care, even back then. Uh, I mean, there was no health care offered uh, in the prior, uh, by the prior company. Being a drug company, they had probably the best health care policy, one of the best in the country. This being a non-union plant, the 
the only non-union plant in American Home Foods. They wanted to keep it that way. So they offered the, all the employees, the hourly and salary here at this plant, that health care plan at no cost to the employee. That was, uh, you think about what that would mean today, but it meant it, about as much then. So that was the, uh, one of the real big changes of the uh, buyout and uh, takeover. The other thing that happened, it put money, uh, made money available to increase the marketing area and the sales area. They immediately went to moving product into the Northeast, New York City, Harlem in particular, which became a, a major market for us. Philadelphia, all the major, all the cities up in the Northeast, we shipped product to. They uh, then opened up the West, we went as far west as Little Rock, Arkansas. So in, in the process here in 1972, our sales were very strong. And if some of you may remember what happened in 72, so similar to what's happening now. Energy costs just went through this roof and that affected everything. So being a part of American Home Foods, we were part of under the wage price guidelines. Couldn't take a price increase. We had a, a chicken line for the meat kitchen, which had two or three chicken items, uh, potatoes and beef. Uh, something as odd as chicken gizzards, I remember. But anyway, chicken wings, we put a, a whole wing and a thigh in the can of chicken and dumplings at that time and then filled it with gravy. And when I started buying, a guy by the name Al James came down with that nurture and uh, became plant manager. His primary duty was to rebuild the wastewater treatment plant. But uh, he had created a purchasing scheduling job for me. So when I started buying chicken wings, I was paying eight cents a pound for them. Within six months, four to six months, they were 40 cents a pound. So we were losing three to five dollars a case on the product as it went out the door. So they suspended the meat uh, production here for over a year. Contrary to that, on the bean side, because people are having trouble buying meat protein, everybody started buying protein in beans. And so the Lux brand just took off. We could not keep up with the demand for the product. So since in 72, we went to uh, Haddock, Georgia, a company called Cherokee Products Corporation. The Bloodworth family had run it for probably 100 years. They didn't really pack beans, and I think uh, Gary Anderson's not here, so I can't call on him to verify that, but they had the equipment to do it. So we sent a team down there, Gary Anderson, who was a technical manager, Clinton Calmer, who was a uh, supervisor here, and Dorothy Crisco, that worked for Gary, and they, they packed, set up the uh, plant to run and pack uh, pinto beans. They packed 150,000 cases in about seven months for us to get us over the hump. So that was the uh, peak of the business, I would say. Then uh, we started, the business started to falter a little bit, and uh, Al James, who had come down as plant manager, had taken a position with RGR Foods in Winston. And we've got a guy by the name of Barney Borns who came in from the Laporte Indiana plant, where he actually, I think he ran the bakery there, as plant manager. Well, he, he was responsible for really stepping up the uh, increase in productivity here. I think when I came to work here, the main kitchen line ran like 125 to 150 cans a minute. In the 80s, we changed the whole process. We put in 400 gallon kettles to replace the 60 gallon. Uh, we automated the fat pack part of the uh, process, which would have done a bottleneck. Uh, put in uh, new, more, new and better cookers. And uh, at the end of the, uh, that period, we had to put in a new Zachme 48 pocket filler, which was the top of the line in, in the industry that day. We were running 550 plus cans a minute. So cost-wise, I think Kim Yao is here somewhere. Kim can verify this. Our, our direct labor per case probably never went over 19 to 20 cent a case the entire time from the time that the business started. So we did a very effective job of controlling cost um, and, and making uh, a product that was sellable and profitable. In 1983, there was uh, decision made by corporate management to move a Jiffy Pop popcorn line here. 
which was uh, at that time was still pretty popular, although it was under attack by the microwave bag business then. And uh, we moved, eventually had two lines of pop up, jiffy pop up in that building that uh, Jack and Dean are now working in. Uh, a unique business, hired a, bunch of, hired a bunch of people, more people. Then we decided that we wanted to get in the microwave business. So the president of the company was a guy by the name of David Jakes in New York. But he didn't want to be in the bag business like everybody else. He wanted to develop a package, unique package for microwave popcorn. Microwave popcorn then had its problems. It was the shelf life on it was only about six months because it would dry out in the bag. And I remember buying bags of it and it wouldn't have pop. So we, we developed, we got a, a plastic bowl that was called CPIP material. It was microwave. And I know Gary Anderson and others here did a lot of work on it uh, here at Cedar Oak. But you could, we made it, there was a metalized mylar strip that was put under the bowl in a cardboard tray. You could actually watch the, and then the bonnet on it was clear mylar. You could actually watch the popcorn pop in the microwave. And it took off like gangbusters. And uh, we bought a prototype line to begin with. So we went back and bought another full production line from a company in Chicago called Tisma Machinery. And uh, spent, I think, between the two of them, somewhere around two and a half to three million dollars. Uh, it went well for a couple of years, but in the wintertime, the CPET bowl was actually hot milk glued to the paperboard tray. And then uh, out in the Midwest and the West, where in the cold weather, we started having all these complaints the bowl would turn loose from the <laughs> from the, the glue would break and the bowl would turn loose from the tray. Uh, then some, I forget which company in Korea developed, started shipping microwaves to this country. And their microwaves, instead of having the solid uh, turntable, they put slots in it, I guess, to let heat get up through the uh, turntable more. Well, that not only posed a problem for the bag people, it would, burn, it would set bags on fire in the microwave. I think a house or two may have burned down somewhere. But he would also do it on our, our uh, package. And that's good. we got a new president by the name of Charlie Morosa, and Charlie wanted no part of it. I get a call from my boss one day to be in the Manhattan office the next morning. He didn't tell me why I was coming, so I figured he wasn't to give me a raise or a promotion. I got took to lunch with the president and him and two or three other guys to tell me over a $60 piece of white fish for lunch that they were gonna shut down the microwave line, and they did. And just wrote it off with it, one swat. Uh, but again, that was, again, was part of the, the negative history of the thing. The Jiffy Pop business stayed here with the old pan side, side type uh, product until the plant was closed in 2002. Uh, Along the way, uh, one of the other things, oh, we, we, in 1996, we had a, a, a big event happen. There was a leverage buyout group in uh, Dallas, Texas, Hicks Muse Taken First. The Hicks in that was Tom Hicks that owned the Texas Rangers. But they bought the all of American Home products or American Home Foods brands, paid something less than a billion dollars for it. I don't remember. Ken, where are you? Okay. Do you remember what the like, what the price was? It was less than a billion, I think they paid for it. Yeah, it was less than that. I, I don't remember. $750 million, million. Anyway, they, they owned it for less than four years. They uh, bought uh, Starkist uh, Tuna out of bankruptcy in California. They bought a couple of other businesses and added to it. Uh, I think it was a cereal company out of Minnesota. And they sold it to ConAgra in uh, August of 2000 for nearly two billion dollars. Tell me that wasn't profitable. But I knew whenever I knew when the first group bought it that it was it wasn't going to be a good thing. For a while we thought we had it made. Then one day I get a call from this guy John Knapp. And John was a former Campbell soup executive. Came down, introduced himself and I spent the day walking through the facility here with him and I knew by his questions what he was doing. So he went back and all of a sudden there was a proposal that they were gonna close Seagrove. Well, I was in uh, uh, Madison, New Jersey for a plant manager meeting, or as I called it, a monthly meeting. They were not fun meetings to go to in those days. 
And I, we went to dinner that, that night, uh, and John was in the group, and we stopped back. There was a guy by the name of Mike Harrell, who was a plant, fellow plant manager, and I had worked for him at one time. We stopped at a little convenience store because uh, Mike was diabetic, type 2 diabetic, and he'd always give him a six pack of Pepsis put in his room in case he needed some sugar during the night. Well, I'm standing looking at a humidor, some cigars, and this guy now comes up and puts his hand on my back and he says, let's buy us a cigar. And I said, well, I got some at home and I'm gonna pay $15 for one. So I walked on off, we'll get back over to the uh, Madison Hotel in, in uh, Madison, New Jersey, go in the bar and he hands me this, a cigar. And he starts unwrapping, was gonna light it, and the bartender come running over. I think she would have sprayed him with an expire extinguisher I'm sure if he had a little match. But I, you can't smoke that here, so we had to but said you can go to the lobby and do it. So I would go to the lobby, light up the cigars, and he tells me they're going they've made the decision to close secret. And I said, Well, where are you gonna go with it, John? And he said, We're going to Fort Worth, Texas. I'm gonna make the product there, and I'm thinking that's a, about the stupidest thing I ever heard. He, yeah, the word intermodal, if you remember that term back then, was a big thing in transportation. So I got back to the plant and I got I called this guy Ivan uh, Metropolis. That was another story. Of the first time he came to the plant, he and his, the two pilots that flew him around, that was the longest and most miserable day of my life. And when he left, I had three pages of handwritten notes that we had to respond to. He said, I, you're going to have to respond to this in a week. Well, we did. I mean, some of them, some of it was just junk and gobbledygook and stupid stuff anyway. But uh, we had the response to him. Well, I get a call from him the next week thanking me. He said, I, you're the first plant manager that has ever that has got this stuff in on uh, answered and back to me on time. And I, so after this event and uh, with the closing of the plant, I called Ivan. And I told him, I said, I, that sounds stupid. He said, well, we think so too. He, so I said, well, let me and Ken Yao put together some numbers, primarily Ken did it, but uh, uh, we did, and rather than saving two million dollars, it was going to cost about a million and a half. And so I get a call from my buddy Mike Carroll in Vacaville, California, the next week at the Vacaville plant. John had showed up out there, and they were, going, they were looking at closing Vacaville, and eventually did. But uh, Mike said, I got some news for you. He said, John Knapp just came in here, and he said, I had a call from uh, I think it was Scott Foos that was probably the guy that was the, his boss that we had so many, I can't keep up with him. But he called, he said, you have now called me when he gets in, he fired him right there in Mike's office. <laughs> so we kind of saved it that time. But when ConAgra bought it, it was, I knew it, wasn't, it was not to be done. And I see Dean look at his watch and I, uh, I'll, I'll end it with that other, the, other than to say this, I've heard a lot of talk about the employees here and the kind of people they are. And that, that was the thing that always impressed me about this facility. People who worked here were motivated, self-motivated a lot of times. Of course, the, the, you know, the pay scale and the free and the insurance and all that was a help to it. But we wound up with a lot of talented, skilled people here over the years. And, uh, okay, I see the <laughs> and, it, and you know, I, I'm talking about, I used to drive by here and I wouldn't even look at the damn plant after it was closed because I knew it was a stupid decision, but it was one of those things that we had no control over. I mean, that was what corporate America was doing then. The guy who made the decision to close this plant was South Africa. So, uh, Con, uh, ConAgra had a whole bunch of South African management people for some reason. And uh, that was, he and another guy that was a consultant actually in Omaha, the office there were the ones who made the decision to close this plant. I, Greg Smith was the last boss I had, and was a former Quaker State, Quaker uh, Oats guy. He came to the plant, he told me I went to Philly, Chicago after 9-11, and he was coming to Seagrove, he said, I want you to put on a show for me, dog and pony show, and I said, well, we can do that. We had a staff here that was top notch, uh, Lisa Smith, who was here, but we had, uh, we had probably the most modern uh, conference room in the, in the whole company back here. Everything was done with projectile computers. And, uh, so we put on a program for him and he went back. I, I told him, I said, you, if you let this plant close, you'll lose something you'll never get back. He said, what's that? I, he, I said, people. You, you, you will never find people anywhere else that, that are non-union and that are, will work like this. And apparently he believed that. He went back to California. Their uh, office out there was at uh, John Wayne Airport, and I, I called it 
black glass menagerie building. When you come out of the John Main Airport, you see the building. And uh, I, I was sitting one day, and Gary Anderson come walking through my door, and he shut the door, and he said, you heard the word from California? And I said, yep. I said, don't get excited, but because uh, Greg had just called me, they, they made the decision at the California office to rescind the closure. They were not gonna close it. And so Greg called me right away and says, but when it goes to Omaha next week, maybe a different story. Well, it was, it's, those guys didn't change their mind. So that was the end of Lux as, as we know it. And I could talk for another hour or two, but I won't. So anyway, I, again, I, I, it was a great place to work. I had a great career here as did a lot of other folks uh, uh, that came along about the same time I did, so thanks. Hello to my family. I'm so glad to see my family here. I miss all y'all so much. But this is dear and near to my heart. I lived here a mile away. Can you imagine that? Every day I only had a mile to go to work. And actually, I could smell it really good. He <laughs> those onions, especially. You could smell it. I couldn't hang clothes out on the line. <laughs> but um, it's, it's amazing the stories and the good times that we did have. But um, I just want to tell everybody I'm in shock. There's no place like Lux. You know, I, I grew up with these people and they watched me grow up. But like you say, when you go by here and it was closed, you didn't want to look at it. Because that was your life. And I'm sorry, but don't let me up here all the time. <laughs> anyway, I just want to appreciate these people for helping us, the, the Leos and all the donors. Um, I'm just so excited to see the place come back together. And I hope to see y'all many more times. Before, you know, we can't wait 10 more years. I'm sorry, we might want to do it a little sooner because uh, we are getting a little older. But I uh, just want to say I appreciate everything that's been done here and it's just so great to see everyone. Thank you. I don't know if I need a microphone. <laughs> How are you? We've heard a lot of stories. I spent a lifetime here, it feels like. I grew up in Sigrove. Martha here was my second grade teacher. I don't mind telling you that. <laughs> Not saying she's old, but we were in a small town. Larry Hancock, his mama had 4 age. We have ties here. And so it was not a problem. I was working for Clinton on the farm, pulling corn by hand, driving an old blue truck with side planks. I was right across the street from the service station. So it was a give me, I come to work at Lux because it was family then. And every kid in Seagrove that wanted a job in the summer ended up working at Lux. You had three choices. Jack come along, started plastic. There was a lumber plant in Lux. That was only three places. So we grew up together and this uh, plant helped put a lot of kids through college. Cause if their parents worked here, their grandparents, you had a job in the summer. Or when the semester ended for Christmas, most kids didn't want to work, but mom and dad had them a job lined up. They had no choice to come to work here. So it was a great place to work and uh, it was family. And a couple of things uh, here, I know a lot of folks that never worked at Lux here because um, Seagrove's not that big when you met Jack. Jack done a lot for the fire department years ago. You met people at the Dairy Breeze. They would work, walk from Midstate across to the Dairy Breeze to eat. So my wife was there, so we would meet people. Yeah, or we weren't married then. But uh, I would like to do a couple of things. And I had some things here and I worked the summers, went to RCC, sort of like the rice, come back and in 75 there's a recession. And we went, I went to work here and I told Heron Leach, I said, Heron, when something opens up, I need a job, there's a recession. I took business administration. 
And everybody really, if they're honest, come to work at Lux because they were headed somewhere else. But after you get into the system, very few people left. And basically the company left us. I ended up 31 years, but the company left us. And so Gary Anderson was the QC and like Dry said, we branched out. He and I went to Tennessee to help start the Lux line. It was a union plant, nothing wrong, but it wasn't family. I would be Daryl's helpful self and somebody was lifting bag and you to help them. They said, you can't do that. I said, yes, I can. <laughs> That's not who I am. And that was one of the decisions. I didn't stay. I could have stayed in Newport, Tennessee, but it wasn't family. Now there's two things, I, well, there's three I want to do before I present uh, some items here. But as I progressed from truck loan to QC, lead person, supervisor, production superintendent, but it was family and this time of year, I would have made an announcement on Thursday to honor all veterans. And if you will graciously, whether you worked at Lux or not, if you're not able to stand, raise your hand. But if you're a veteran, this is Veterans Week, please stand. Something else that they would laugh about, Lucy Rice passed away not long ago, but my employees, whenever it was their birthday, supervisors know, I would get on the intercom and see. I have the worst voice in the world, but they got me back at one of the company picnics. I got the Golden Note Award. <laughs> but Ernest Morgan, if he may not remember, but Ernest, raise your hand. It was Ernest's birthday one day. He takes off. So I call his home early that morning. He's still in bed. And I think his wife answered. She said, Ernest, it's for you. <laughs> and so I sung happy birthday on his day off. So we got known that you can't take off and Daryl not seem to. <laughs> and one of the saddest notes, I mean, it was terrible. Only when the plant closed and we had to go somewhere else did we know what we lost. And most time that's the thing about it. you realize what you lost when it's gone. But I want to lift up the name Calvin Davis. Calvin died in a workplace accident here. It affected us all. But they say if your name's spoken, you're not forgotten. So a lot of people here will remember Calvin, but he died working for Lux. And Darius and them did well. They shut the plant down, give everybody a day off, and it made a difference. And I know Carol Edwards and I had to go to Calvin's family and tell them, you know, and we assisted them and everything we could. And one thing, where's Lisa Smith at? Lisa? Well, I'm sorry. I wanted to pick there. Dries mentioned Bumblebee. There was a strike or something, and Lisa had to go down and help can tuna. And they had a retour, and that was the experience for her. But at this time, I want Dean to come up. And what we've got, Nikki Kennedy. Nikki, where are you at? Stand up right there so people can see. Nikki, uh, we were all working. Gary Anderson. We had come back, we wanted to be here when the plant closed. And so Nikki was the cooker operator that day and that's where the continuous cookers were. And so when I told Nikki I had the last can, I was talking to him just to verify my facts because it's been 18 years ago. And so Nikki had some cans that he wanted to donate to the museum. So I'm going to get those first.
This is a sample like the rice was talking about. Potatoes and beef and gravy was canned in 1972. And these two cans are empty, but Nikki found out they were up at the uh, Garner Brother Pawn Shop. Cause they used to be in every mom and pop store. It wasn't Food Line and Lowe's and all those, every little store. So Nikki went and bought them and took the labels off and put on empty cans. But this is Brunswick stew and that was some good stuff right there. And uh, I worked, like I said, and I'll tell you a short story. Therese Allman was over inventory and Therese, uh, we had eight ounce cans of Brunswick stew and in the warehouse, we would take a can and tape it to the back of the uh, radiator on the forklift. And by lunchtime that night, I said, it was boiling. <laughs> so the inventory says there's 93 cases. So Therese is up there looking around counting. He normally come up with 78 and he's beating himself up trying to find them. I finally said, Patrice, we have eight of them. You'll never find them. <laughs> so we had to adjust the books. But uh, we were a little big crowd at Lux that you can see they're, they're part of my problem. Now, these, this is a can Nikki labeled as the last run. And that's the uh, can that the shield was running. And watching when you're retired, Andy Roach of everything has to have a uh, prominence. So what I have, and Gary Anderson is in Knoxville, Tennessee. He's not with us tonight, but he gave this to me 18 years ago. And I'm not complaining, but I'm glad to have it out of my house. Now it's got a home. <laughs> And Gary wrote a note, and basically it says, Daryl, I work, want you to have the last can made. I think it should remain in Seagrove. I can attest that this is the real last can. I made a mental note of the angle of the printer on the lid. And I'm not sure Richard Saunders or poor Harold Brewer was the lead person, <coughs> pardon me. But Dean, if you can see this, it says, last can and it has the date. So there's the last can from Lucky Corporate. And there's the note that goes with it and Gary Anderson, Drysel Tay was the QC manager or however he was top QC. And he was in the cooker room with Nikki when they come through. So uh, hopefully it's found a home and at least as Lux people now, we know we've contributed something to the museum or to the old Lux historical. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you can really see why it was such a family organization with these great people, Darius and Daryl and Mary and everyone that's here. Uh, but it is going forward from here, and we want to talk just a few minutes about that. So, uh, and then we're going to get to the door prizes. So, everybody, uh, keep keep up the energy. But I'm going to introduce Kerry Durham. Kerry curated our art out here, and uh, he's going to tell you a little bit about art and pottery. Thank you, Dean. Uh, unfortunately, based on the night, I wish I had worked at Lux because it sounds like a great uh, place to have worked, but I did the next best thing. I worked for Jack Lale. <laughs> and, you know, L, Lux and Lale, we go together. It has certainly been a godsend that Jack Lale came to Randolph County and I'm um, a better man for it. He's been a wonderful mentor in my career and I'm sure he's meant a lot to everyone in this area. Um, tonight, uh, I am going to talk to Art about Art a little bit because